Hey folks, Mark Levin here. Now, before we dive in today's episode, I want to talk about something truly valuable, protecting your financial future with gold. It's called diversification. Now for that, I only trust Advantage Gold. They're the real deal with five-star service and a sterling reputation. So give them a call today. Call Advantage Gold at 800-900-8000. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Trust me, you'll thank yourself in the future. Now let's get to the show. Results may vary. Consult with your financial professional. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Look, I normally don't do this, but we have three hours, and there's three huge subjects I want to cover. One is the trial in Manhattan. The other is what the International Criminal Court did. And then the last is uh, Biden's speech at Morehouse College. And there'll be other issues, too, but these are three big deals. Three big deals. And I want to start with the Trump trial. On March 31st of this year, really not that long ago, what is that, six weeks ago, give or take, Mr. Producer? I had Brad Smith on Life, Liberty, and Levin. And, you know, I do these long-form interviews, and we talked about the allegations and the charges against President Trump, and we talked about federal law. He made it abundantly clear that this non-disclosure agreement did not violate federal law. That is federal election law. He's a former chairman of the FEC. It's probably due to that interview because this judge knows what he's going to say that this judge determined that Bradley Smith is not going to testify as an expert witness on behalf of Trump. I have never seen one abomination after another like this. I have never seen anything like this. Seriously, folks. This judge is barely knowledgeable about the law in the state of New York, let alone federal campaign law, which can be very complex. Apparently, he's doing everything he can to undermine Robert Costello's testimony today, so Costello can't tell the story of what took place as the prosecution keeps objecting, 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 and interrupting. The judge should have put an end to that, but he didn't. This guy is so in the tank. He's like a mob judge. Except I don't want to really libel the mob. The guy's a punk. And so we went back and we found part of the audio of the March 31 interview with Bradley Smith, the first segment. I have the full text here. Uh, honestly, we shared this with uh, everybody at Fox as well to remind them that we know what Bradley Smith's going to say rather than speculate. Rather than the lawyers talking to lawyers, lawyers talking to non-lawyers, non-lawyers talking to non-lawyers about what he might say. And so he said it. He said it. Right there. For millions to hear, and millions did hear. So let's begin with this. 
with Bradley Smith, the former chairman of the Federal Election Commission, a not only an expert on federal election law, but he still teaches it today as a professor. Cut 29, go. The Alvin Bragg case rests on an effort to federalize state law to turn a misdemeanor, if there is one, into a felony based on a bizarre interpretation of a, camp- a, of a violation of our federal finance laws, federal campaign laws, one that was already tried, but interestingly enough, by Jack Smith with John Edwards and fell flat. Do you want to explain to the American people the core of what Alvin Bragg's attempt is with respect to federal election law? Sure. So to upgrade what would be a, a very routine misdemeanor in New York to a felony, the DA has to show that uh, this misreporting, as he alleges, was done in order to conceal a crime. The crime he says that was being concealed was a violation of the Federal Election Campaign Act. And what he says that was, was that uh, by paying money to Stormy Daniels for her silence, that that amount it to a campaign expenditure and therefore it was not properly reported under federal law and that jacks the whole state claim up to a, a felony. Now the problem with that is uh, that Federal law does not say that anything that you think might help you win an election is a campaign expense. Rather, it's an objective test in which things like polling, paying for staff, paying for headquarters, uh, you know, paying for advertisements and so on. Those are campaign expenses. And the law, in fact, specifically prohibits someone from using campaign expenses or making campaign expenses for personal use. That is to pay, you know, things that might help you like good looking clothes or, or plastic surgery or good looking haircut or. Uh, you know, a nice relaxing vacation so you're fresh on the trail, a country club memberships you can entertain, uh, or settling nuisance business suits so that they're not an issue in the campaign. Those are all viewed as personal expenses, and they're not something you can pay with campaign expenses. So I think that's the problem that the DA have. He's trying to allege that these campaign expenses, or I mean, I'm sorry, these, these payments to Stormy Daniels were campaign expenses. And I, I think quite clearly they exist from an obligation independent of uh, Mr. Trump's campaign for president. You mentioned the Edwards case. We'll go back to Edwards. This was tried a similar case with John Edwards. People remember him ran for president uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, Edwards had supporters who uh, spent money to support and keep quiet a mistress whom he had gotten pregnant. Uh, And that went to trial. Uh, The jury ended up either hung or acquitting Edwards on a number of counts uh, that that was, you know, finding that that was not a not an offense under federal campaign finance law. And live now, this is what the judge does not want the jury to hear. The judge is conspiring with the prosecution to keep the ambiguity of some federal offense sort of hanging over the trial as a dark cloud. And he doesn't want it defined because if it's defined, it becomes clear it's inapplicable. There's nothing there. And of course, if you don't have the federal offense, which requires intent, by the way, then you don't resuscitate the state law, which has expired, let alone increase it from a misdemeanor to a felony. Now, we're unable to find the remaining part of the interview, so I want to read this to you. So I go on, but the theory is the same theory, which is that if anything is done that may positively impact impact your campaign as opposed to negatively impacting your campaign, and let's say it's it's then it's an illegal, unreported corporate contribution, or in the case of Edwards, just an illegal contribution. And this is why people are saying that this is a preposterous case. It's sort of a, a maze that you have to go through and follow. It's why the U.S. Attorney's Office wanted nothing to do with it. It's why the prior district attorney wanted nothing to do with it. Bragg dusts it off and he says, no, even though I'm a local DA, I'm going to pass judgment on federal campaign laws, which he has no jurisdiction to do. I'm going to assert that this non-disclosure agreement that was provided, but it is in the wrong category as a legal expense, or maybe it should have been a business expense. And I'm going to assert all of that was done in violation of federal campaign law in order to create a positive campaign image. Is that about right? So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm playing this so you know why the judge does not want Bradley Smith, his testimony, and also to point out one other thing. 
You watch me on Fox, you listen to me on radio and on Blaze, because we're way, way, way ahead of the curve on this stuff. And Bradley Smith answers, yeah. I mean, that's his theory. He says, and by the way, Mark, also, the Federal Election Commission chose not to act on this. That is, on the Trump issue. And they, under the statute, are supposed to be the primary interpreter of federal campaign law. And here's the thing about this, is that had Trump used campaign expenses to pay off Stormy Daniels and file this as a report, you can pretty much bet your house that people on the left would be coming after him for misappropriating campaign funds to pay personal expenses. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the nondisclosure agreement was a personal expense. It was an expense for the campaign. It wasn't a campaign expense. And that's how the FEC considered it. A personal expense categorized as a legal expense by the corporation, all perfectly legal, nothing triggering federal campaign laws, period. And he went on, did Brad Smith. And in fact, even now, people on the left in the last week or so have released a spate of columns and commentary arguing that Trump cannot use campaign funds to pay his judgment against him. In another, I think, kind of preposterous suit, and that's this alleged civil fraud suit with 450 million judgment or whatever it was. So you have a sense that they were going to get get him coming or going. If he paid for it, that is the non-disclosure agreement with campaign money, they would say it was personal use. That is misuse of campaign funds, a felony. If he doesn't pay for it with campaign money, they want to say, hey, you didn't properly pay for it with campaign money and report it as a campaign expense. And you can't have it both ways. And he says, and I think the DA's theory ultimately is going to crash. He may even win a trial there in New York and everything. But eventually, I don't see it standing. Me. But in the case of John Edwards, it was even more direct, even though it wasn't a violation of law. That is, donors did raise the money and provided to protect Edwards from the negative publicity. And in that case, and in this case, rather, in Trump, we have a state law, a reporting issue that I would argue isn't even a misdemeanor. And then you have the D.A. going into federal law where he has no jurisdiction. You just said the FEC, the FEC that oversees it says, no, no violation. The U.S. attorney doesn't want anything to do with the prior D.A. And he's twisting the law. He's twisting it to try and apply it to Trump. So it's even, in my view, worse than the John Edwards case. Brad Smith. Well, I think it is, and it's worse. And in another way, which is in the Edwards case, it's entirely clear that they were paying his supporters. They were paying this woman in order to protect the political viability of Edwards. Whereas in the case of Donald Trump, well, that was probably a consideration, or at least may have been a consideration. He also had a number of other considerations to protect himself, his wife, his children, commercial interests, and so on. So, yeah, I just don't think that there's any real basis for alleging that this is a campaign expenditure. I always put it to people, you know, when you contribute money to a campaign, is this what you expected to be spent on? And the answer is no. This was a personal expense. Now, by the way, personally means corporate too. By personally means it's not a campaign expense. We're with Bradley Smith, Capital University law professor, former chairman of the Federal Election Commission. He founded the Institute for Free Speech, I say. Non-disclosure agreements. HR departments enter into those all the time, every day. Media corporations that are calling this hush money. I noticed NBC has entered into non-disclosure agreements. agreements. Most non-disclosure agreements are secret, so we didn't even know. They entered into my CNETs, entered into them. All kinds of people have entered into them, so... And by the way, members of Congress, as my wife reminded me, in 2017 entered into a whole ton of them. So is it the effort here by the media and others, the Biden campaign, to try and turn this into some kind of a treacherous, evil event? He's trying to cover it up with hush money, and then he uses corporate money, and then he uses it in violation of campaign federal campaign laws? Isn't this all bogus? Bradley Smith, the probably number one expert in America on the federal campaign law, responds, yes. There's a lot of smoke. And as you point out, Mark, I mean, hush money is just a pejorative term. You can call lots of settlements hush money, or you could call them settlements and non-disclosure agreements, and usually they're called the latter. 
And in this particular case, for example, I draw the comparison. You know, they're businessmen. Like Trump will always have a lot of lawsuits going against his various businesses. And he may, in particular point, you know, tell his local counsel, say, look, I want you to settle this lawsuit. The guy says, no, it's a good case. He says, now just sell it because I don't want it distracting my campaign. He's doing it to help his political campaign. That doesn't make it a campaign contribution. He couldn't expense it on his campaign funds to pay off that settlement. And with a non-disclosure agreement, and that's, again, the problem that the DA has here, as you said. It's a lot of rhetoric. It's a lot of smoke. But if you really start boring into it, you start asking people, okay, where is the illegal violation? That is, it becomes pretty flimsy. This case is also weird in another way. I said the U.S. Attorney said, I'm not going to get into all that. It's too long. I hope this helps explain things. There's personal, or what's better to say, non-campaign expenditures and campaign expenditures. If the Trump organization, his lawyers, his accountants, Trump, he'd pay this out of the campaign, it would be a federal offense. An illegal corporate contribution that wasn't reported. But they didn't. They put it down as a legal expense on their business ledgers for the whole world to see. They didn't conceal anything. As a non-disclosure agreement, there is no federal campaign law issue. That's why this judge, Mershon, does not want Bradley Smith, Professor Smith, former chairman of the Federal Election Commission, testifying. Because he would shoot a big torpedo in the side of this case and once for all sink it. And I encourage my brothers and sisters at Fox, play it so your audience understands it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. You know, folks, China, Russia, Iran, they're all on the move. Right here in the U.S., you've got inflation, you have open borders, and of course, an election year. Oh, and we just crossed over $34 trillion in debt with no signs of slowing down. It's time to wake up, folks. There's a lot at risk, possibly even your retirement account. The time to protect yourself is before a crisis, not after. Advantage Gold, the gold and silver company I recommend to help Americans. Well, they'll help you prepare now for times just like these. Call them at 800 900 8,000 today. Get their free 2024 gold and silver kit. Plus, tell them I sent you, and they'll give you a special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300 if you qualify. Call Advantage Gold today. Here's the number. 800 900 8,000. Plus, see if you qualify to get your special discount worth up to $1,300 today. 800 900 8,000. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Well, well, well. This judge in Florida is a real judge. And she knows how to be a real judge. This judge in Manhattan is a low IQ mentally challenged political hack nitwit who's appointed by a Democrat, who in turn is elected by a Democrat, and they're elected by the same people who elected Alvin Bragg. The judge, Aileen Cannon, in Florida, has about had it with Mr. Rogue Prosecutor Jack Smith. I want to tell you a little bit about that when we return. There is a ton to do, all of it important, And we'll do it only the way we do it, you and I together. Be right back. You know, folks, we've got an awful lot swirling around this country, both internally and externally. We've got wars going on in all parts of the world. We've got riots effectively going on in our colleges and universities. 
We have inflation through the roof. It's an election year to boot. All these problems are often huge tailwinds for gold, which is why gold is at all-time highs looking like it's going to go higher. And when it comes to gold, I only trust my friends at Advantage Gold. They help Americans just like you protect your retirement accounts and help safeguard your wealth through diversification. So call them right now. 800-900-8000. Get their free 2024 gold and silver kit plus a special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300 if you qualify. Call Advantage Gold right now, 800-900-8000. See if you qualify to get your special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300 today. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. Yes, it's true that Mark Levin is the fastest growing radio show in America. The Mark Levin Show is on at 877-381-3811. You know, ladies and gentlemen, it takes a lot of self-restraint to do this show. I'll give you an example. There are topics I want to address, you know, fully, but I can't wait to get on to the next one and the one after that. I just want to get them addressed. But now and then you just got to pull the reins, bite down on the bit. And just do it seriatim. Just do it seriatim. So we have the judge in Florida. And we have this this guy, Jack Smith, who's an unconstitutional prosecutor. And our friends, they call themselves Epic Times, Mr. Vaduz. Did you know that? I thought it was Epic, Epic. It's a fantastic site. Zachary Stieber, the federal judge overseeing one of the criminal cases against former President Trump, on May 19 expressed concern and disappointment with special counsel Jack Smith. So this is over the weekend. That's why I don't want you to miss this. U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon, who is a fantastic judge, an appointee of President Trump, said that Mr. Smith and his team have taken inconsistent positions during the case as it pertains to keeping some information sealed or hidden from the public. She said in two separate filings related to sealing, the special counsel stated without qualification that he had no objection to full unsealing of previously sealed document entries related to allegations of prosecutorial misconduct in light of that repeated representation and in the absence of any defense objection the court unsealed those materials consistent with the general presumption in favor of public access, she said. The materials that were unsealed, though, contain information such as grand jury details that the special counsel has and continues to say, and all other filings should be kept sealed. Judge Cannon asked for an explanation of this inconsistency. She said in response to those inquiries, counsel explained that the special counsel took the position on unsealing in order to publicly and transparently refute defense allegations of prosecutorial misconduct raised in pretrial motions. Fair enough, she says. But nowhere in that explanation is there any basis to conclude that the special counsel could not have defended the integrity of the office while simultaneously preserving the witness safety and Rule 6E, that's Grand jury information that's not to be disclosed. Rule 6E concerns is repeatedly told the court and maintains to this day are of serious consequence in which the court has endeavored with diligence to accommodate in its multiple orders on sealing and redaction. Judge Cannon described herself as being disappointed in these developments. She added the sealing and redaction rules should be applied consistently and fairly upon a sufficient factual and legal showing. And parties should not make requests that undermine any prior representations or positions except upon full disclosure to the court and appropriate briefing. Now, why is she concerned about this? Anybody know? Because the prosecution is deciding in one situation to waive the 6E, that is, the grand jury protections, or the classified document protections, or the witness safety protections, and then in other filings, they're demanding that the court embrace all three of those and not release the grand jury information or the witness identities or the classified information. And what she realizes is he's trying to play the court. They want information out that they think will help them, 
and they want information concealed that they don't think will help them. Or, just for fun, if President Trump's lawyers want information out, the government's saying no. And the, the lack of integrity that this prosecutor and his team are using obviously is undermining due process and the rule of law. You don't get to pick and choose. The government doesn't get to pick and choose. The order came after Mr. Smith and President Trump filed competing proposals for redactions in response to a May 9 order from the judge that directed the parties to submit the proposals. The audit concerns several motions filed by President Trump, including a motion to dismiss the case based on allegations of prosecutorial misconduct, which have not been placed on the docket. The proposals for redactions are also not yet public. There have been many issues of prosecutorial misconduct, including the mishandling of classified information, which disgustingly, ironically, are the subject of the charges against the former president. Both parties and the judge agree that the names of potential witnesses or information that would clearly identify them should be kept hidden, along with ancillary names and personal identification information such as addresses. Redactions agreed upon by both parties were accepted by the judge in the new order, and a few exceptions. President Trump's proposed redactions to some witnesses' statements were rejected. Let's continue. And I'm sure you didn't hear any of this. That's why I'm here. I fill the gaps. No basis is provided for these redactions. And the court has previously denied requests to redact the substance of potential witness statements are relied upon in pretrial motions. The judge also turned down a request by the special counsel to redact some of the same information. Judge Cannon, see, let, let me give you a bigger picture of this. During my several years at the Department of Justice, including his chief of staff, When we would catch spies, when we would catch spies, and we could see the extent of the classified information and the level of the classified information that they had stolen and then were paid for in almost every case, but not every, and turned over to the communist Chinese or the Russians or whomever it was, we always had a concern because going to trial... Trials are supposed to be open and open to the public. That's what the Constitution compels. Why? Because they feared the British judicial system where the judges were, worked for the Crown and these were effectively show trials. And the public wouldn't know and you didn't have uh, juries of your peers and everything. That's why all of this is pretty much in the Bill of Rights. Now, all that said, how do you try a spy and Bring out all the evidence, all the classified information, all the information about investigative techniques, wiretaps, eavesdropping, monitoring. That you don't want the enemy to know. In an open court. I mean, you can't seal the whole court for the whole trial. So typically, typically the the most uh, notorious of the spies, they face the death penalty. So what we did or what the department did, was in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table, they would plead, in many cases, to life sentences, or what were equivalent to life sentences. You know, the guy's 70 years old, 40 years, something like that. So the information didn't have to be publicly revealed. Jack Smith has a problem. He's trying to persuade the court and he's going to have to persuade a jury about the nature of these classified documents and that is what Judge Cannon is having to balance here that's what she's having to deal with here and that's why I'm guessing I don't know where I I'm guessing that's why she's frustrated because Jack Smith wants to have it both ways he wants to release what he wants to release and he doesn't want to release what he doesn't want to release well that's not a principle that can be applied equally and across the board and also protect the defendant's due process rights. So what do you do? And that's the issue. I think I've made that pretty clear now. No, Mr. Producer? Maybe I'll teach law one day. Ernie Grabatsky's Law School. 
Now, Judge Cannon said that for the redactions where the parties disagree, she would accept for now President Trump's characterization of portions of the material falling under privilege. Pending her review of privilege arguments, she would also accept the special counsel's position on six, the fed, on rule six of the federal rules of criminal procedure, despite the concerns in her outline. So what she's saying is, look, I'm going to, just in case, I'm going to choose for the side of non-public information on the grand jury information, because we do have this rule 6E. And I'm going to choose on the side that the information the president and his lawyers say is privileged is privileged for now as we go through this. Until and unless we work it out. I don't know what else she could have done. She did the right thing. And she warned the prosecution, you better get your ass in gear and get your act together. This isn't about you winning the case. This is about we need to have standards, standards of work, standards that follow as closely to law as possible and standards that are applied to whether it's classified document A or classified document B, unless you have an argument on why B is different from A. Very, very important. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. All over the world, our enemies are on the move. And in our own country, same thing. Things are tough between rising prices, election issues, a $34 trillion debt. But folks, there is good news. If you're smart, you can use these problems to your advantage. By making the right choices right now, you can keep your retirement money safe and even make more money in this climate. That's where Advantage Gold comes in. They're experts in helping Americans protect their savings with gold and silver. It's called diversification. Call Advantage Gold today, 800 They'll send you a free 2024 gold and silver kit that tells you how to keep your money safe when things are bad. Tell them I sent you, and you may qualify for a special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300. Call Advantage Gold at 800 900 8000 800 900 8000 See if you qualify for that special discount worth up to $1,300. That's 800 900 8000 Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professionals. In our third hour, by the way, around 820, we're going to have uh, Brent Bozell, founder, chairman of the Media Research Center on the program, uh, to talk about January 6th and his son and how he was treated. Um, and I think uh, you're going to be very concerned, very, very, very concerned. You've heard a lot about a lot of these uh, folks who got caught up in this and uh, but the kind of punishment, the kind of treatment, it's important that he explains it. And I certainly want him to have an opportunity on this platform to do it. I've known him a long time, his family, they're f- fantastic people, great patriots. Oh boy, all this legal stuff going on. You got to wonder at some point. You got to wonder at some point if we're ever going to get this country back. But I'll tell you this I go to this diner. Ah, five days out of the week, went on our home in Florida, and such fantastic people there, just down to the earth people. And the waitresses, what do they call them? White staff? No, I call them waitresses, and they like being called. Are really special people, and obviously they live off of whatever they earn each day, and they walk an enormous amount in that restaurant, and they're always smiling, and they're always friendly. And uh, one of the ladies said to me, why don't people see what we see? Why don't people, meaning not you, obviously, the others, see what we see? I said, that's a very complicated question, but to put it as bluntly as possible, because they don't want to see it. Because one degree or another, they are fanatics, they're zealots, either for their party, certain bizarre principles, belief systems, they've been indoctrinated, but they don't think for themselves. I said, the vast majority of people who support a Biden 
or trash is run support Hamad. They're not. They're not people with functioning, properly functioning minds. And so they're susceptible to indoctrination. And those who are busy indoctrinating them are quite evil, whether they be professors, whether they be politicians, whether they be family members, whatever. They're evil. Ladies and gentlemen, Marxism is not a new idea. It's been around since the 1840s, 1850s. It's been tried in 14, 15, 16,000 different ways. The end result is always death, destitution, horrendous inhumanity, like Islamism. It's not like it hasn't been tried. It's been tried for several thousand years. It is diabolical. It's evil. It's inhumane. Islamism. So the president of Iran and the foreign minister die in a helicopter crash. And our government sends out its condolences. The president of Iran has a long history. He was called the Butcher of Tehran. Do you know why he was called the Butcher of Tehran? Because when that revolution take pl- took place, he was responsible directly and indirectly for the slaughter of 15,000 Iranians. And we, the United States government officially, put out a condolence for his death. How sick is that? I've got more. We'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Welcome, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Donald Trump outside the courtroom this morning. Cut 11, go. All corrupt, and it's all coordinated. It's a shame. Mark Levin, John Adams said liberty without virtue is tyranny. We have tyranny right now. We have tyranny right now, and we're disgracing our New York court system. And we're really disgracing our country because all over the world they're watching. Bill O'Reilly, Donald Trump and his family do not deserve this blatant miscarriage of justice. Don't applaud the destruction of justice because you may be on the receiving end someday. That's Bill O'Reilly and hundreds of others. I don't think there's one person that says that this trial is legitimate and everybody's talking about the judge shouldn't be doing this trial. He's totally conflicted. This is the most conflicted judge probably in the history of the court system. And everyone knows what I'm talking about. And during the course of this trial, under questioning, and I think the defense has done a great job, actually. They have a hostile judge. The entire environment's hostile. They're having to fight against the system, the Democrat Party monopoly in the courtroom, and their judge. And Michael Cohen had to confess that he stole tens of thousands of dollars from Donald Trump and his organization by altering an invoice. Just when you think this guy is the lowest scuzzball imaginable, there's something else that they find. Even fake tap out seemed relatively surprised, even though he wants Donald Trump hanging by his feet on a telephone pole like Mussolini. Cut 13, go. It's it's fascinating stuff, and I have to say I'm still kind of reeling from the revelation uh, that um, Michael Cohen stole money from the Trump organization, and that wasn't, at least to my knowledge, that the prosecution didn't get that that out earlier. 
uh, because it's not as though um, the prosecution is going to be helped by further uh, evidence that Michael Cohen is. is See a what an idiot character. this guy is. He doesn't. Do you know why the prosecution didn't put that out, Mr. Producer? Because they didn't want to. They didn't want to. They were hoping the defense wouldn't bring it up. That's not the question, tap out. The question is, why would you put a man on the stand as your number one witness? To try and put a former president who's running for president in prison to try and breathe life into a misdemeanor statute that's dead by some ambiguous claim of some kind of a federal election violation when you know there wasn't one. So the real question for CNN and fake tap out and all the rest of them is, why would the prosecution put this man on the stand and bring this case at all? And they just can't, they just can't address it because they've been slobbering all over this for a year. Go ahead. And, uh, let's, I'll get to the newest stuff in a second, but like, I mean, what you, what's just, what's your reaction to that news? Because that was just kind of stunning. I'm, I'm shocked that we are hearing it for the first time on day three of cross-examination of Michael Cohen, that the prosecution did not take the sting out, did not front it. Because- did not take the sting out. <laughs> How do you take the sting out? The fact that he stole tens of thousands of dollars from the man he's trying to put in prison. How do you take the sting out? Ellie Honig, I don't always agree with him. He's a lawyer there at CNN, but he has more integrity than anybody else over there other than the janitor. Cut 14, go. Michael Cohen explained this whole thing, quote, that's what was owed, and I didn't feel Mr. Trump deserved the difference. That's a lot different than I stole $60,000 from my boss on the transaction at the heart of this case. And by the way, the fact that he was ever charged with larceny is important because stealing $60,000 through fraud, which would be larceny in New York State, is more serious of a crime than falsifying business. Which he never falsified, Trump, by the way, nor did any of his people. As Brad Smith has stated over and over and over again, which is why the judge doesn't want Brad Smith to testify. You are experiencing what is a Stalinist show trial. This is what it looks like. Exactly like this. Except it's a little shorter. But nonetheless, Danny Cavallos. MSLSD legal analyst. I have no idea who these freak frauds and phonies are, but nonetheless, even he was shocked. See, they're trying to position themselves. They said, look, I've been trashing Trump. I've been building up brag. I've been building up this judge. I've been talking about Stormy Daniels. I've been really excited about the case. And so, but now I have to worry about my own reputation as a lawyer. Nobody's going to hire me. Because I'm such an a-hole and I say the most preposterous and stupidest things imaginable. So I had to reverse course just a little bit. Just a little bit. Cut 15, go. There may have been a real moment here just in the last few minutes in that Michael Cohen was caught in cross-examination. They asked him uh, by, about a transaction with another company where he admitted to stealing cash from the Trump organization. Now, throughout this trial, consider this. The prosecution has painted Michael Cohen as sort of this bumbling, pathetic character whose only sins were his misguided, undying loyalty to Donald Trump. Did you lie to Congress? Yes, I did. But I did it because I was in the sway of the Svengali hold of Donald Trump. But now you see something a little different. Now there's an argument to be made that actually you're just an opportunistic thief. You literally pocketed. So what does that make the prosecutor? Who knew all of this? What does folks, this is nobody wants to focus on this. The prosecutor suborned this testimony. Is trying to create a fiction or to remake a criminal, Cohen, in order to get Trump. That's not his job. The prosecutor works for the government. He's supposed to work for the public. His job is to do justice. It's to bring truth to the courtroom. Does it sound like that's what he's doing? This man should be referred to the ethics committee. Of the highest court in New York. 
This man should be facing a criminal investigation on his own. He's talking about taking out with 34 counts. That's what he wants to do. The Republican soon to be nominee for president of the United States to clear the field for Joe Biden. And same with the judge. So he's forced to admit on the stand what the prosecution knew and hid, hid from the jury. Go ahead. And as a as an attorney, the idea, first of all, of paying in bags of cash is, look, uh, defense attorneys, uh, I do not like to accept cash. I, I frankly, I refuse to accept cash. It's only asking for trouble. But dealing in these uh, these sandwich bags of cash, these brown paper bags of cash to pay people is already problematic. But the idea that he would just grab a wad of cash and stick it in his pocket, I think has moved Michael Cohen from this figure where he's part Tom Hagen from The Godfather, but really more like Fredo Corleone, to now this guy who's just a thief. Wow. What analysis, huh, Mr. Producer? We didn't know he was a thief before. We didn't know he was a fraud before. Now we're really convinced. 100%. This is really grotesque. Well... Even more grotesque is the prosecutor knew all this. Even more grotesque is the is the judge. Even more grotesque than the prosecutor. I'm serious about this. Now, Robert Costello, they brought him on to testify, and the judge did everything he could to obstruct him. Everything he could. Everything he could to obstruct him. And just to remind you why, very quickly, Mr. Bedusa, let's go to cut 23. Go. I really want to hone in on something else. So you've laid the predicate. This is, these are the facts. Uh, really, he had no reason to lie to you, and you gave him every opportunity, really. That's Cohen. To protect himself. And that would even mean, if necessary, implicating Donald Trump, and he didn't. Now, but I want to move on. You testified in front of the Bragg grand jury. Is that correct? That's correct. Michael Cohen had waived attorney client privilege in writing, and you've presented that. You've shown it to the whole world, correct? I have. Yes, that's correct. You were the last witness to testify in front of the Bragg grand jury, to the best of your knowledge, correct? To the best of my knowledge, that's correct. And you testified in front of this grand jury. Were you actually free to testify? Or were you, as you said, when you came out of that testimony, you were repeatedly interrupted. They were repeatedly trying to shut you down. Is that correct, too? That is correct. There were eight assistant district attorneys in the room. Eight. I've never seen that before. You indicated I saw earlier reports from a few years ago with up to 300 or so emails which is basically contemporary communications with Michael Cohen that would certainly collectively demonstrate that he was lying about material information that Mr. Bragg was looking into, correct? Correct. But they wouldn't introduce all 300 emails, would they? Is that correct? They put six in. I objected. I said, aren't you going to put the remaining emails in right in front of the grand jury? And they said, We can't. I said, why not? They said, there's a legal problem. I said, really? What's that? He said, hearsay. Well, first of all, hearsay is admissible in grand juries. And I said, well, you just put six out of that package in. Why not put the rest in? These people, meaning the grand jury, are entitled to hear everything. They're entitled to see everything. And I had my own packet of the same materials. So they said, uh, We can't put them in because they're hearsay. So I said, all right, if you think they're hearsay, listen carefully to my next two sentences. These documents were made in the regular course of business. And it was the regular course of business to make and maintain documents such as these at or about the dates indicated on the documents. I said, now, you know, and I know, but the grand jurors don't know. That makes these documents business records. And you know, and I know, but the grand jury doesn't know. Business records are an exception to the hearsay rule if it was in effect. I said, so what's your next excuse? You think you should give these to the grand jury? And then I held up the packet to the grand jurors. And I said, you people should demand these from the district attorney and then ask yourself, why are they keeping these from you? Okay, so you had the packet. 
Apart from what the grand jury heard, the district attorney's office had all the emails, correct? Correct. So they could read over 300 emails, correct? Of course, yes. The Friday, as a courtesy to show that I was being fair to them, as a courtesy, the Friday before I testified, I gave them an hour and a half Zoom conference in which I was going to explain all of the exculpatory material that I had and why they should not proceed with this case. When I walked, when the Zoom conference started, they told me that they had all of the evidence that I gave them. And they said, assume that we've read everything and understood everything. What do you want to say? That's how they began. And I said, that's hardly a warm greeting for somebody who's trying to help you out. Now you know why the judge didn't want him to testify without constant interruption. And the Joshua judge, not through any kind of a formal arrangement, but he's obviously colluding with the prosecution in that he knows what the prosecution is doing. And he wants to assist them. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've covered the field better than most. We've got another field to cover. The International Criminal Court. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. We're so fortunate in this country to have a military of men and women who voluntarily lay their lives on the line for us. But when their service ends, transition to civilian life can be very difficult, especially now. Access to housing, employment, even their earned VA benefits can be very difficult. That's why Pure Talk proudly helps support America's warrior partnership and their mission to prevent veteran suicide. This is very important. You can join the fight when you switch to Pure Talk's 5G service and help Pure Talk support this great charity. Remember, Pure Talk was founded by a veteran. Through the end of the month, they'll match every dollar donated up to $50,000. Folks, choose a wireless company that shares your values. Upgrade your cell phone service to America's most dependable 5G network. Just 20 bucks a month. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin. puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N. Make the switch, folks. That's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N. Levin. For superior cell phone service, that's half the price of Verizon. AT&T or T-Mobile and to help Pure Talk help our vets. The International Criminal Court, founded after World War II, has no jurisdiction in the United States, has no jurisdiction in Israel, has no jurisdiction in a lot of countries. And it was created in order to police basically Europe, given its instinct for mass murder with its Marxism, or fascism, or whatever it is. And because the leftists control that court, and the prosecutors are leftists, they actually turned on the state of Israel. They compare it to Hamas, and they pretend by condemning Hamas that their condemnation of Israel, they issued arrest warrants for Prime Minister Netanyahu, for the defense minister, for the head of the IDF, arrest warrants, which means they can literally be arrested if they travel to another country. I want you to listen to what Benjamin Netanyahu said. Cut 28, go. The outrageous decision by the ICC prosecutor, Karim Khan, to seek arrest warrants against the democratically elected leaders of Israel is a moral outrage of historic proportions. It will cast an everlasting mark of shame on the international court. Israel is waging a just war against Hamas, a genocidal terrorist organization that perpetrated the worst attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Hamas massacred 1,200 Jews, raped Jewish women, burnt Jewish babies, took hundreds hostage. Now in the face of these horrors, Mr. Khan creates a twisted and false moral equivalence between the leaders of Israel and the henchmen of Hamas. This is like creating a moral equivalence after September 11th between President Bush and Osama bin Laden, or during World War II between FDR and Hitler. What a travesty of justice. What a disgrace. The prosecutor's absurd charges against me and Israel's defense minister are merely an attempt to deny Israel the basic right of self-defense. And I assure you of one thing. This attempt will utterly fail. Eighty years ago, the Jewish people were totally defenseless against our enemies. Those days are over. Now the Jewish people have a state and we have an army to defend our state. Notwithstanding the blood libels Mr. Khan has leveled, Israel will continue to wage this war in full compliance with international law. We will continue to take 
unprecedented measures to get innocent civilians out of harm's way and to ensure that humanitarian assistance reaches those in need in Gaza. Mr. Khan also sets a dangerous precedent that undermines every democracy's right to defend itself against terror organizations and aggressors. The ICC has no jurisdiction over Israel, and Mr. Khan's actions will not stop us from waging our just war against Hamas. But Mr. Khan's abuse of this authority will turn the ICC into nothing more than a farce. He's doing something else. He is callously pouring gasoline on the fires of anti-Semitism that are raging across the world. Through this incendiary decision, Mr. Khan takes his place among the great anti-Semites in modern times. He now stands alongside those infamous German judges who donned their robes and upheld laws that denied the Jewish people their most basic rights and enabled the Nazis to perpetrate the worst crime in history. Two weeks ago, on Holocaust Memorial Day, I pledged this. No amount of pressure and no decision in any international forum will prevent Israel from defending itself against those who seek our destruction. To all the enemies of Israel, including their collaborators in The Hague, I renew that pledge today. Israel will wage our war against Hamas until that war is won. Because never again is now. And that's the way it's going to be. And the collaborators, Biden put out a statement, the State Department put out a statement. But ladies and gentlemen, remember I told you this was coming? And I said they wouldn't put out a statement in advance. They wouldn't condemn what was coming. They waited until it actually came. What's that all about? What's that all about? I'll be right back. We're so fortunate in this country to have a military of men and women who voluntarily lay their lives on the line for us. But when their service ends, transition to civilian life can be very difficult, especially now. Access to housing, employment, even their earned VA benefits can be very difficult. That's why Pure Talk proudly helps support America's warrior partnership and their mission to prevent veteran suicide. This is very important. You can join the fight when you switch to Pure Talk's 5G service and help Pure Talk support this great charity. Remember, Pure Talk was founded by a veteran. Through the end of the month, they'll match every dollar donated up to $50,000. Folks, choose a wireless company that shares your values. Upgrade your cell phone service to America's most dependable 5G network. Just 20 bucks a month. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin. puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N. Make the switch, folks. That's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N. Levin. For superior cell phone service, that's half the price of Verizon. AT&T or T-Mobile, and to help Pure Talk, help our vets. Can't got your tongue? Cough up a fur ball and call 877-381-3811 right now for Mike Levin. So there's now movement in Congress, in the House of Representatives and somewhat in the Senate, always at the initiative of the Republicans, to sanction the International Criminal Court. And you know what? When you think about the name of it, the International Criminal Court, it is an international criminal court. Nothing has ever been better described. Out of all the cases it can bring around the world, does it bring one against Xi in China? Oh, no way. How about UN in North Korea? No way. How about the Islamo-Nazi Khomeini that runs Iran? No way. And by the way, to the president, the, they lost their foreign minister. Good. 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 They're mass murderers. The United States sending its condolences? Why are we... <laughs> the UN, they, they had a moment of a silent prayer? I guess it's allowed there. What do you think about that, folks? That our government would do that? That is, give our condolences? The guy slaughtered tens of thousands of his own people. The butcher of Tehran. Well, nonetheless. Will our Congress do something? It really must. Will the Democrats help us? Donald Trump again. 
You know, this amazing thing when you think about how right he has been and how right he was. He warned this court, don't you ever, ever think about issuing any kind of warrant or anything else against America, any of our diplomats, any of our military, and any of our politicians. And he would have stood up against it with Israel, too. And the time to speak up was before they issued these arrest warrants to Bibi Netanyahu, to his defense secretary, to his generals, too. But he wouldn't. By the way, did you know Bill Maher is going to be on Gutfeld tonight, Mr. Producer? The promotion's enormous. So I just wanted to point that out. I'm not allowed to go on CNN or MSNBC. No, just saying, folks, just saying. So the International Criminal Court has really destroyed itself today. And my concern here is what I wrote about before our, our buddy Brian at Right Scoop had posted it some, some weeks ago. And so this is going to spread further anti-Semitism because these imams, the, uh, the, the river to the sea crowd, the Hitler youth all over the world, they're going to say, see, we were right. They're certified genocidal war criminals. Now, so I looked into this a little bit. Do you know how much testimony and information they took from the Israeli government, Mr. Producer? None. And by the way, America, George Clooney's wife, who happens to be Muslim, she was one of those who filed a complaint against the state of Israel. Oh, but Hamas, too, you know, like they're one and the same. George Clooney's wife, and he's proud of her. I think he said he's proud of her. Well, I'll never watch another George Clooney show, movie, buy another stupid product that he's promoting, ever, ever, ever. These are the, these are the events in history. These are the events in history that determine who's who and what's what. These are the events in history. And the Clooney's have failed. And what gave her standing? I don't know, the foggiest idea. I don't know who the hell she is. Maybe because she's a Clooney. Or maybe because any moron can file whatever they want with the International Criminal Court of Criminals. How many of you can name any of the judges on the court? Exactly. How many of you can name this prosecutor? Exactly. This is one of these globalist efforts by the radical left, particularly in Europe, to try and steal the sovereignty of our country and obviously Israel. Now, Israel has its own judiciary. And its judiciary is iron-fisted. It is a very strange, out-of-control, all-powerful judiciary. In many ways, similar to the International Criminal Court, except it doesn't hate Jews. It's made up of Jews. So you would think that given the nature of the judiciary in Israel, that the International Criminal Court would say, well, they got their own thing going on there. But no. Now, tell me about the judiciary in Gaza, Mr. Producer. Is there one? Summary execution, I think. You know, rape and torture. Tell me about the judiciary in the entire Middle East. In the Muslim and Arab countries. Say what? Exactly. So we give our condolences because one of the, one of the genocidal maniacs, Islamo-Nazis, who slaughtered tens of thousands of his own people, not to mention was behind, in many respects, the slaughter of American troops in Iraq and elsewhere. We gave our condolences? That's like the the King of Jordan has been in the Oval Office twice. He runs a murderous, genocidal regime. But Benjamin Netanyahu, not once. Not once. So my question is, why didn't Biden and Blinken speak up earlier? Why didn't Biden and Blinken speak up when word was out that this that this maniac, that this Jew hating court was going to do something? Why didn't Biden say no? Trump would have. Why didn't Blinken say no? Pompeo would have. Would have had some influence. But they didn't. Now they want to get credit for criticizing it. This is how they play the game. It's so cynical. I believe the invisible hand of this administration lends support to it. 
That's why they didn't come out against it before before this took place. Arrest warrants for the Prime Minister of Israel, the, the uh, Defense Minister of Israel, the generals in Israel? Seriously? And comparing them to the subhuman, sadistic devils in Hamas? Think about that. I understand Netanyahu will be on Fox tomorrow morning. I don't know, Bill Maher tonight and uh, Netanyahu tomorrow morning. I'll definitely watch tomorrow morning, won't you, Mr. Producer? Yeah, that's definitely worth watching. Joe Biden at Morehouse College. Morehouse College is a historically black college. Joe Biden, like the other so-called dignitaries on the stage, they're dressed in, it's either navy blue or black gowns. And given Joe Biden's history on racism and segregation and his opposition, leading opposition, with some of the worst racist segregationists in the country at the time. Shouldn't he have been wearing a white gown, Mr. Producer? The answer is yes. Why would the president and the administrators and the trustees and the board or whomever at Morehouse College invite Joe Biden to speak? Unless he's going to apologize for his history, why would they invite him to speak? Because he's a Democrat, that's why. Any Republican that had a background like that, there's no way in hell they'd get invited. They would never invite Donald Trump. Donald Trump doesn't have that record. Donald Trump doesn't have Joe Biden's history with segregationists and racists and opposition to integrating schools. Quite the contrary. Donald Trump, throughout his business career, hired thousands and thousands of minorities. Thousands. Joe Biden's never hired anybody because he's never had a career outside of being a government bureaucrat. But that said... He spent years early on in his career. That's just dismissed. So the way it works today is Donald Trump is the racist. Donald Trump is the anti-Semite. Joe Biden is the great white savior. Do I have this right? And the speech he gave was so diabolical, so evil, that I hope... The black families or interracial families or white families that were sitting there and listening were repulsed because he thinks so poorly, so lowly of black people. He resorts to the usual hysterics, trying to create anger and emotion. There's nothing cerebral about it, there's nothing positive or inspiring about what he's saying. He is there yelling at the audience about America, yelling that they don't have a shot in America, yelling about this, yelling about that. He is a sick bastard, and all he cares about is himself. When we come back, unfortunately, but it's important, I want you to hear some of this. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. We're so fortunate in this country to have a military of men and women who voluntarily lay their lives on the line for us. But when their service ends, transition to civilian life can be very difficult, especially now. Access to housing, employment, even their earned VA benefits can be very difficult. That's why Pure Talk proudly helps support America's warrior partnership and their mission to prevent veteran suicide. This is very important. You can join the fight when you switch to Pure Talk's 5G service and help Pure Talk support this great charity. Remember, Pure Talk was founded by a veteran. Through the end of the month, they'll match every dollar donated up to $50,000. Folks, choose a wireless company that shares your values. Upgrade your cell phone service to America's most dependable 5G network. Just 20 bucks a month. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin. puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N. Make the switch, folks. That's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N. Levin. For superior cell phone service, that's half the price of Verizon. AT&T or T-Mobile and to help your talk help our vets Joe Biden 
yesterday before we go to Morehouse College on Saturday at an NAACP event in Detroit. Go! He calls an erectionist who stormed Capitol Hill Patriot. Say what? Did we already add this to the mumblers or are you going to? I, I, can we hear this again? What is it with the Democrats and the, the erection language all the time? Or what is it with people always want to hear erectile dysfunction commercial? I don't get it. Cut five, go. He calls an erectionist who stormed Capitol Hill Patriot. <laughs> um, you have the mumblers, our collection handy there, mister? Okay, America, we get more requests for this than anything else. Go. What are they? Can you get a funding? The ghost track? They have an eye. It costs when if you they just gave you gave them. Quit the the withdraw bringing U.S. home troops from home. And 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 the the the. Hey, you know you know you 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 you, you need somebody. Wait. So uh, what, finally. What? And, uh, um. Of 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 un uh, of of budget about a budget. But resist, we much, we must, and we will much about that be committed. I, 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 I'm I'm a warrior. <laughs> um, you know the the that it was. The, 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 I mean, they, 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 they said that. Look, the 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 yeah, the lives are stripped. Was it him? Why? I I I I didn't. If 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 we if we you know it uh you know it 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 we can walk and chew gum. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by go. You know the you know the thing. True and international average of pressure. Been impeached for inciting the erection. Donald John Donald John Trump incited the erection insurrection. And what am I doing here? I'm going to lose track here. And uh, to confidence in the integrity, private, uh, private uh, 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 economic. Uh, no, 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 no. Don't let, let them. You know how much I'm going to do with the deficit this year? Bridges and those bonds that are collapsing. And, you know, it is it is um, it is, you know, it is not uh, it is a it is. Happy birthday, dear Valley. Part of the, um, the, um, uh, Mr. The, the, uh, the, sen- uh, the, the, I don't do some of you to some of the leadership of, uh, the, every, that, well, Kajan, Kajan, Katanji drowned Jackson. You docs are good, but there's any angels in heaven, they're all nurses, male and female. God save the queen, man. President Trump incited an erection. Uh, and Mess with the men on the Beer brewed here. <laughs> it is used to make the brew beer in this final. Oh, Earth Rider, thanks for the Great Lakes. I wonder why he's doing <laughs> Participated in an erection. Say hello to oyster bunnies. Come on up, bunny. He calls the erectionist who stormed. You know, that's not it. We've been collecting that for like 20 years, haven't we, Mr. Ferguson? At least, maybe 22. That's right, the first one was an Amtrak guy. An Amtrak guy. So when we come back the next hour, we're going to have our friend Brent Bozell. But before we get to Brent, I want you to hear some of this speech. It's going to be very unnerving to all Americans, regardless of race and so forth. You don't go to a college campus majority black students, and you start screaming, 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 these racist bromides left and right. That's not what America's supposed to be about. That's not how you unite people. That's not how you inspire kids. He is a loathsome, loathsome man. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Call an erectionist who stormed Capitol Hill Patriot. <laughs> the erectionists who stormed Capitol Hill? 
By the way, Mr. Producer, can you see if you can find our buddy Sid real fast, see if he's around? Yeah, right now. Why not? But first, Joe Biden at Morehouse College cut one Mr. Producer go. You start a college just as George Floyd was murdered. And there was a reckoning on race. It's natural to wonder if democracy you hear about actually works for you. Okay, okay, stop, stop, stop a second. <laughs> George, George Floyd murder. You started college. It's natural to wonder if democracy you hear actually works for you. These are young Americans, okay? They're young Americans, red-blooded Americans. And they're going to college. Two-thirds of Americans, all races, don't go to college. So for these young people, America is working. They're going to college. They want to go to college. They just graduated. They're beginning their careers. And so Biden feels it his responsibility to pull them back and drag them down and tell them the country doesn't work for you. What's the point? What's the point? That's not what a statesman says, black, white, yellow, red. That's not what you say to young people who just work their hearts out for four years first to get into college. I mean, a lot of these kids are working to go through college, maybe their families or whatever the reason. And they go through and then you get this guy, this old befuddled buffoon. Who's telling them democracy doesn't work? I know you're wondering about it because of George Floyd. Go ahead. The black men are being killed in the street. What is democracy? The trail of broken promises still lead back. Whoa, 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 whoa. If black men are being killed in the street, what is democracy? That has nothing to do with democracy. It has to do with a number of things, including mayors and city councils that undermine their cops, judges that don't put criminals away. It has to do with broken families. There's a lot involved in that issue. And rather than try and take it on and address it, which he's never done, he's never done it. Only thing he did is pass this 1994 bill he sponsored that he knew was targeted toward blacks in the inner cities. It punished crack use more than cocaine use. He knew it. The NAACP told him. But he's forgiven. He's forgiven. It doesn't matter. If Joe Biden had had his way, our schools would not have been integrated. Think about it. And he's up there talking about how democracy doesn't work for black people. And he's invited by Morehouse board or the president or whomever to speak. Go ahead. Behind. What is democracy? You have to be 10 times better than anyone else to get a fair shot. And what does that mean? You get poor people in this country with all backgrounds, some recent immigrants. If some kids grow up, their parents have died tragically or been murdered or something. Maybe one of them had cancer or anything. And they have to fight like hell to survive and to accomplish and to hear this all based on race, 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 race. He's a racist. That's what he is. And he's a racist in what he's saying. He stereotypes those black kids, red-blooded Americans who are sitting in the audience. He's stereotyping them. And he's giving the worst kind of a racist, anti-American speech imaginable. Why? Because he wants to stir people. He wants to anger people. He wants to, he wants to convince them that the only way you can survive with democracy is to, is to vote for him. Guy's been in government half a century. And seriously, ladies and gentlemen, particularly in the black community, what the hell has this guy ever done? Name three things he's done. If he's worried about democracy in the black community, name three things that he's done. Just three. Name one. Go ahead. First of all, what does it mean, as we've heard before, to be a black man who loves his country, even if it doesn't love him back in equal measure? Oh, my God. 
Oh, my Lord. My dad was right about this guy. He was right about this guy. He said, this guy's no damn good. Cut to go. The black matter being killed on the street, we bear witness. Excuse me. Your FBI statistics, and folks, you can look it up, show that the most people that are being murdered are young black men, and the perpetrators, overwhelmingly, are young black men. Okay? This has been going on for decades. So what is Biden doing about it? He won't even discuss it. He's on attack, and he can't say George Floyd enough. He wants 2020. He wants the riots. That's why when the Hitler youth were running around, that was good as far as he's concerned. The more chaos, the more anarchy, the more upset, the more anger, the more divided the nation is, the better it is for him and his party. Go ahead. That means to call out the poison of white supremacy. White out supremacy? White supremacy? I wish everybody in the country could hear this speech. I really do. This, this racist pig. But for these politicians, but for these professors, but for these fools on TV, this country would be far more harmonious and united in every respect. But look at him. Look at him. His coalition is based on People hating each other, turning out the haters, getting people angry, even if they're not hanging. These are kids. They're graduating from college. They're sitting there listening. And they listen to this. And by the way, a number of the kids got up and turned their back toward them. Now, they say that's because they don't like what took place in Gaza. As far as I know, it's because they don't like him. Period. Go ahead. I stood up for George with... George Floyd's family to help create a country. We don't need to have that talk with your son or grandson as they get pulled over. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mr. White Supremacist himself. Go ahead. Instead of a trail. Let's move on. Cut three. Cut three. Insurrectionist. Storm the Capitol. With Confederate flags. How about insurrectionists who storm our colleges with Palestinian flags? What do you think about that one? In 400 college campuses. What do you think about that one, Joe? You've never spoken out against that. Go ahead. Not in my house. Black police officers. Black veterans. Do you understand, folks, that this guy was conspiring... With old Confederates? For the early part of his life? For the early part when he was a senator? Do you understand that? And he's talking about Confederate flags? He's talking about Confederate flags. He didn't talk about the swastika. He didn't talk about any of that stuff. The Palestinian doesn't talk about any of that. Didn't even talk about American hostages in Gaza. He's trying to push the hot buttons. He's got nothing to show for his presidency. Nothing to show to the black community or any other community. And when he unleashed inflation, it, in, it, it, it impacts poor neighborhoods the worst. Like the black communities in our inner cities. Or the borders wide, wide open and illegal aliens coming in. Gang members from Venezuela, MS-13. Drug dealers and drugs pouring into our country. You see what's happening in our cities, all over the country, but what's happening in our cities? Is that what he means, Joe? Go ahead. Capital. Recall another word, as you recall. What? They also say out loud, these other groups, immigrants poison the blood of our country. Like the Grand Wizard of Jackass. You jackass. With your history, with your background, with your statements about black people. You dare to point a finger at anybody else? Are you serious? Ladies and gentlemen, we must defeat this man. We must clean out Washington. 
or every community in this country is going to suffer and suffer and suffer. His policies know no color. They impoverish and devastate everybody. He, he's an equal opportunity destroyer. But he is a racist to the core. He's always been a racist to the core. And he's spewing this stuff because he's stereotyping black people. He thinks this is what black people want to hear. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's always difficult, isn't it? When you have a kid or a grandkid and something happens to them that you can't fix. And uh, it really strikes you at your core. Particularly if it's an injustice, particularly if something's taking place that you know is wrong and you know is evil. And as a father or a grandfather... You can't fix it. And so Brent Bozell is a dear friend of mine, dear friend of the family, my wife. His whole family is fantastic. He's a patriot. He's been a patriot for decades. He's made such a difference in this country. And you saw the press last week, and I wanted to give Brent the opportunity, if he wanted to, to talk about this and what happened to his son to the extent he wants to or doesn't want to. And Brent Bozell, God bless you, my brother. The floor is yours. Well, the first thing I want to say, Mark, is is thank you. Uh, and also thank Julie for the kindnesses that you've shown uh, through this, this whole ordeal. Um, and you and I have been talking about this for quite some time. Uh, no, look, look, this is a situation, I think you and I disagree a little bit about Judge John Bates, um, who presided over the trial. Um, but in, in the final analysis, it, it, was a, it was a difficult trial to adjudicate. Um, but when you saw the Biden Justice Department in action, it was, it was frankly not just astonishing, but truly frightening, and something I can now attest to uh, firsthand. Um, the Bill of Particulars, my son is not a political person. My son is a husband and a father to three young girls. Uh, he doesn't participate in any political organization. The only uh, thing that he participated in leading to January 6th was a prayer group that prayed the rosary every day for America. He, like tens of millions of others, believed that the election was stolen and he came to Washington to the Trump rally. Now, leading up to that rally, he did, again, what tens of millions of people do. And and I I would have guessed that 98% of your audience uh, did. In private text messaging or private emailing messaging to friends or family, which is to say vent, to say things that, that we've all said uh, at one point or another, you know, storm the breaches, uh, the hell with them. We've got to take over America, um, et cetera, et cetera. We all do that in emails or whatever to each other. My son doesn't post on social media. My son did not take any public statements on anything. My son texted two family members and about two or three friends. He texted all manner of things, including his, uh, his plans to come to Washington to organize a music festival at the presidential rally on January 6th. Okay, so he went to the rally with his mother and two other uh, brothers, and uh, uh, all hell broke loose with the tear gas and, and whatnot, and everyone got separated. At the end of the day, this is what my son did. He went to into the Capitol, which he ought not to have done. He went to one of the decks, uh, on the outside decks, uh, was standing next to a policeman, talking to a policeman, 
a, ga- a crowd gathered going, the, going down the stairs behind him, a, a, a curving steps behind him, when it gained maximum uh, 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 pressure where it couldn't move anymore, someone said push, the whole group pushed forward. My son, who was at the top of the steps, went forward and went towards the policeman. Now, why is all this important? Because stop and back up. When the charges were first filed, my son was accused of breaking two windows, two felonies, and then an assortment of other charges once he entered the Capitol. My son was willing, absolutely stood up and was willing to take his medicine on all those, but he was not willing to take a plea deal on obstruction, which he knew was going to be thrown out by the Supreme Court and was and the Justice Department was trying to ram down everyone's throats. So he didn't take a plea deal of several years from the Justice Department. This was early on in the process. We waited, we waited, we waited. We knew something was going to happen because the Justice Department was not going to leave this one alone. Sure enough, on the eve of the um, of the trial, two and a half years later, in comes the charge of assault on a policeman. They show this footage, granular footage, from a distance. You can barely make out that it's my son. You simply see him move forward. You don't even see any conclusive evidence that he even touched the policeman. I want to repeat that. No conclusive evidence that he even touched the policeman. And he turned and he went inside. Why was it assault? Well, until this trial, I didn't know the technical meaning of assault. We all think it means attack. It doesn't. It means an attack or impede or interfere with the policeman's duties. And on that, that was the assault charge. And on that, he was found guilty. And he had pled guilty on everything, on everything else. He said he wasn't contesting any of the other things. So now my son is been, has been convicted of assaulting a police officer. What was his defense during this? Not only was it not that he didn't that, that he didn't assault a policeman, it was that on three separate occasions that day, he came to the aid of policemen. Once when there was a policeman who was incapacitated because he'd been tear gassed, and it was my son and only my son who brought him water. Once when a policeman was knocked over well, by an opening door, by the way, we were never able to find that footage from the Justice Department. Thank you very much. And the third time, when a, somebody was pulling out a baseball bat to hit a policeman, and my son was the one who stopped them from doing it. Let's None wait that- right there, Brent. We have a hard break. I want to pick up right from here. So we will be right back so, so you can continue. We'll be right back. Mark Levin, the research arm of conservative media. Call in now, 877-381-3811. We're with Brent Bozell, who is uh, telling us of this harrowing story about his son. So your son came to the help, to the aid of three different cops. And then what happened? The, you, you would think that the Justice Department if it was being fair, if it was being objective, if it looked at that grainy, grainy evidence from so far away that questions whether he touched a policeman and puts it against three established video pieces of evidence that showed him helping policemen, they would have just left that thing alone and moved forward. And matter of fact, this might have augured well in his favor. But they didn't. They rejected it. They, they, they paid no attention to it. And they went on the technicality and they won on the technicality that he interfered because he was at the front of this mob of protesters that pushed forward. He was at the top of the stairs. So he's found guilty on that and he's found guilty on the other charges and he's found guilty on obstruction and he's give, well, he's, he's found guilty on all these things. And now we have to go to sentencing. While we're preparing to go to sentencing, here comes the big one. Something that I never, Mark, in a million years ever thought I would live to see in the United States of America. They hit him with a terrorism enhancement charge. 
terrorism enhancement. Because you were a terrorism enhancement. That what he did was an act of terrorism. And therefore, my son, whose greatest criminal offense is a traffic ticket, my son would be now considered on the same level as Benghazi terrorists, as the people who flew the planes into the, into the buildings in 9-11, as, same as Osama bin Laden, for having brushed by a policeman. So it went to sentencing, and then we learned something else. We learned that the Justice Department was lying about one of the charges. This was uncovered by Judge Bates himself, who pointed out that deep in their reports, in a footnote, they showed the price of one of the windows that had been broken. The repair was, the replacement was $867. One thousand dollars is the threshold for a felony. This had been a misdemeanor the whole time. When the judge pointed it out to the Justice Department hack, she said that well the whole frame had to be replaced. To which he pointed out, well if that was the case, why did you put a price on the window pane? Of course it was just the window pane, and she finally admitted it. The judge offered a mistrial on that charge right then and there, because the Justice Department was lying about it. And we said, no, we would take her just desserts on this, and he would take his punishment on this. So at the end of the day, my son has been been, uh, sent to prison, or is being sent to prison, for 45 months. What I'm putting this in perspective with is everything that the United States saw happen in 2020. In 2020, we all watched when America went up in flames. We all saw Antifa and BLM set fire to one city after another, Seattle, Minneapolis, Portland, New York, St. Louis, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., so many others. Police stations were torched. Dozens of officers were injured. Molotov cocktails were thrown at them. Dozens of people died. The damage was estimated at $1.2 billion, the highest in history. Now, where was the Justice Department, the Biden Justice Department? There. Silence crickets. Tens of thousands of crimes have never been prosecuted, and Mark will never be prosecuted by this Justice Department. They have let them take a complete walk. And in fact, in New York City, the city is paying rioters, paying rioters $13 million for having arrested them. And there's the same kind of settlements as going with country with, with cities all over America. So I put that in juxtaposition with breaking two windows and brushing past a policeman if he touched him and entering the Capitol when he should not have. He got 45 months by the Biden Justice Department. People have to understand, we've made this charge before, and I've made this charge before from from a theoretical position. Well, now I can say it from a firsthand position. This is a, a, a Justice Department that is clearly out of control. It has no interest whatsoever in justice. Mark, you know it, and I know it. His son, my son, is named Leo Brent Bozell IV. They did that because of my name and because of my family and my family's history and because I'm supporting Donald Trump. And they are trying to set, I'm convinced of this, they're trying to set the table for a conviction of the president where they're going to say, if they can pin a terrorism enhancement on someone like my son, they would say if they convicted the president, they would say, you're the mastermind, you're a terrorist. Just watch, watch, Mark. They're going to do it. Wow, Brent. That's just so horrendous. How is your son? You know, Mark, thank you. He's blessed with an unbelievably strong Christian faith. He's blessed with a beautiful bride, and he's blessed with three little children. He's blessed with a a community. Uh, Look, he was doxxed when they first came out. He was wearing his children's Catholic um, a sweatshirt, a grade school sweatshirt. That was his his disguise on, on, on January 6th. But he was doxxed by the left. 
They went to his home. They sent people to his home. They did the most incredible insults imaginable. They tried to get him fired from his job. On and on it went. But the community has rallied around him. They've protected his children. They've protected his wife. So it's a wonderful thing to say. And you know, Mark, I can't tell you where he is because if I did, no, the left don't. would become unhinged. Mm-hmm. No, you can't do that. And in America, what's happened to America? In America? And Mark, Mark, would we, would, would you, would any conservative, any conservative organization ever treat a leftist organization the way it behaves? I repeat that. Ever treat a leftist organization, no matter how radical, mm-hmm. would we ever do to them the way they behave now? They're in this for keeps. This is going to get worse before it gets better. Mark my words on it. You know it, and I know it. Um, I'm, I'm very, very concerned about the future. They're, they're going to do nothing. They're going to do everything, and I mean everything in their power, to stop Donald Trump from being president. Even listen to Biden today talking to black students at Moorhead College. Listen to him, uh, the things that they say right now in court, outside of court, their media. Uh, these people, if they lose the election, I don't think they're going to accept it. I don't think they're going to accept it. When Trump won the first time, they didn't accept it. And they tried to put him in prison. They tried to get him impeached and removed. They're trying to break him. 91 charges. I mean, let me ask you this, Brent. I mean this quite seriously. Well, Well, meanwhile, the media say it's conservatives who are trying to interfere with elections. While right right now, what they tried this year to keep Trump off 36 different state ballots that were trying this before the court threw all that out. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, America has changed. The question is whether we can get it back, isn't it? Yeah, the question is, can we can we, can we do it peacefully? Where is it going to be? Is this going to come down to something awful? Um, mm-hmm. uh, and and my, my concern is, is that it might. Uh, the only thing that's going to prevent this, I believe, is people who come to Congress who are serious, as opposed to the clown show we have right now where 90% of the Republicans are there showing up to get elected. They give wonderful speeches to raise their tens of millions of dollars. They make all sorts of promises on the campaign. Some they come to Washington and they head for the tall grass that you, they will be found nowhere. It's always a handful of senators and it's always about 20 members of the house who are doing all the heavy lifting for the Republicans. If the Republicans were to honor their commitments and really get serious about this country and really get serious about saving this country, then they could do it. But I'm telling you, it has to begin with a criminal investigation into this Justice Department. I actually think there ought to be some kind of a blue ribbon committee with solid people appointed to it that have uh, boundless ability to investigate, subpoena power and all the rest. However, it has to be set up, whether it's through the new Justice Department or whatever, to get to the bottom of this. And that includes subpoena power. That includes interviews under penalty of lying to federal officials. It starts with Garland. It works its way right down through the ranks. And, uh, and you're right. It's the only way it's going to get done. It's the only way we're ever going to fix it if it can be fixed. And I do believe there are plenty of Joe Lieberman left-wing political Democrats who have a sense of honor. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're five. I don't know. But yeah, they're, not they're too many. There. Brent Bozell, we wish you, your son, your family, all the best. If you never need to come back on, you let us know. Mark, you're the greatest of friends. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, it's tough. I mean, his son was willing to uh, to take the punishment for what he did. The problem is that wasn't good enough. They were trying, and in some degree have, punished him for something he never did do and never certainly intended to do. And then to throw that terrorism thing on at the end of sentencing, when you know when your family show up, all of a sudden now, you know, they're looking to put him away 10, 20 years. Uh, they're looking to destroy him altogether. I'm looking here at a story in John Eastman was arrested in Phoenix the other day on charges related to the 2020 alternate electors 
uh, and he wasn't even there, and he had no involvement whatsoever, and they arrested him in Phoenix. Do you see that, Mr. Producer? They arrested him. They took a mug shot. And what is the crime that John Eastman committed? He gave advice to the president and the vice president that the vice president didn't like. And so for that, he loses his law license. And for that, now he's arrested in Phoenix. This is the attorney general of Arizona. And until we get attorneys general in Republican attorneys general who are willing to fight fire with fire, it's going to keep up. It's going to keep because this is what the Democrat mob wants. This is what they want. They've got their pitchforks. They have their fire lan- lan- lanterns. They're on the march. And they're demanding. And their politicians respond. It's that simple. Where am I, Rich? I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. The erectionists who storm Capitol Hill patriots. Erectionists, that's the Democrats. And you know what, Mr. Producer, from now on, I'm calling Democrats erectionists. What do you think of that? All the Democrat, I mean, we have Schumer who does it. We have Nancy Pelosi who does it. We've got whatever the hell her name, buy a pal or whatever it is from Seattle. She does it since they can't get their minds off of Erections. I'm calling the Democrats for now on the erectionists. And the worst among them, of course, are the hemorrhotics. Because it rhymes with hemorrhoids. So I give them a new name. They like these names. They sound very nativist, you know. You're a hemorrhotic. Oh, really? Oh, yes, we checked with Ancestry.com. Really? I'm a hemorrhotic? What's that? No, don't, 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 don't press the point. You're a hemorrhotic. It's right here, Ancestry.com. Great piece by Rebecca Downs in Town Hall. Biden short told some shameless lies about voting rights at Morehouse College commencement. You know, he said, today in Georgia, they won't allow water to be available for you while you wait in line to vote in the election. I mean, the erection. What the hell is that all about? That's been debunked. That's been debunked since forever. Since forever. Leadership is about fighting through the most intractable problems. It's about challenging anger fr- as he's screaming through the top of his lungs and blood's popping out his nostrils. Frustration, heartbreak to find a solution. It's about doing what you believe is right, even when it's hard and lonely. And he claimed that today in Georgia, they won't allow water to be available to you while you wait in line to vote. People applauded. What is it about waiting in line and drinking water anyway? Mr. Pierce, I voted my whole life. I was a precinct where I don't even remember people bringing water. Now, what they're saying is you can bring all the water you want. Your friends can give you water. But water basically can't be used as a bribe by one party or the other. You vote for so-and-so and you get water. That's the issue. Oh, that's, that's definitely racist. Mr. Producer, remind me, we're going to get in a, some callers tomorrow, but today has been... Phil, were crucially important events that I wanted to take the time to discuss with you as I laid out at the beginning of the program. And one of the one of the great things is Guy Fetterman taking on AOC, don't you think, Mr. Producer? And taking on uh, Jake Tapper. Jake Tapper, what a load. Jake, what a load. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel. We salute our truckers, the brave men and women in Ukraine. At least I'm rooting for you. And, of course, our brothers and sisters in Israel fighting a multi-front war, including against Biden. God bless. See you tomorrow.